The desire of Titus Women is to invite women around the world to know Jesus as their Savior, Center, and Source. May God guide and encourage you through this message by Beth Coppage. And what does it mean? Klektos, it's called. He's invited to be an apostle of Jesus Christ. And who is an apostle? An apostle is a sent one. As you and I get ready to leave the in here and go to where uh, to our places of home, our homes, he is calling us and inviting us that he you would not go alone, but you go in all the fullness of God, Ephesians three, and we would know the height, the width, the depth, the breadth, the length of the love of God for us, and that we would go in the fullness of God. And then as we go, each one of us goes, sent by Jesus Christ to the worlds in which you live and the worlds in which I live. And each one of our worlds is a little bit different. That's the beauty of the gospel. So that the presence of Jesus comes in your life and my life and then goes to Mount Vernon or goes to Oklahoma or goes to Maine or goes to New York or New Jersey, or Ohio, because we are sent ones. We are sent ones. God, so Paul was his sent one. And how did this happen? It's the will of God. God would like to come and meet us and fill us with all his fullness and glory so that he can be our missionary agents that go out all over the world. And beginning right here in the world in which we live, so there's a pivotal person for God to come and meet the needs in the worlds in which you and I live. Paul was one of these. It's a beautiful thing. This first, I love this invitation. It's an invitation to enter into the sacred fellowship with God the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. But the happy thing about God is he made us for himself, but he made us for one another. In him and in each other to reach the world for Jesus. And the beautiful thing about the church in Corinth, and Corinth of that day was grossly immoral. It was a trade center. It was wicked. It was prosperous. There was lots of money, but there was it grossly immoral. Does it not sound a little bit like things have not changed too much? So that we are living in this world, and as we go home, we are confronted more and more with just pure evil, pure wickedness, and pure immorality. And so we can identify, and that's why he wrote to the Corinthians. And he writes to the Corinthians, but there's a difference. The church in Corinth, and what is the word that they use there in verse 2? And somebody shouted out to me. Sanctify. Sa good. Thank you, Miss Grace. Sanctify. What does that mean? It means holy. And we're all his, and we're holy his, and we're holy. So as we go out as the sent ones, the, 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 uh, called by God, we are sanctified in Jesus Christ. That's where with the will has said, all of me for all of Jesus. We're sanctified in Jesus Christ. We're called saints. We're called the holy ones. Because there's something that has happened in our lives that when you go to work or when you go to Walmart or when you go to as a nurse, or you're in the hospital, or wherever you are, and the people around you say, there is something different about that woman. She's weird, but I <laughs> sure <laughs> before. But there begins to be, and you and I begin to be like, like potato chip Christians. So that there's that intimate, there's a hunger that begins to inspire. I don't know anybody who doesn't swear. I don't know anybody that doesn't cheat. I remember one of the sweetest stories I ever heard. And the Lord and goes on to say, he uses the weak and foolish things. Isn't that helpful? Because don't we all qualify? I know I do. Well, there was, I, one day I was in Alabama at a retreat. And, and we were, I was praying, this little woman came up and I said, Honey, how are you? What is Jesus saying? And, she, and then I, I said, could you tell me your Jesus story? She said, I'm a believer. And she said, and I said, how did you become a believer? Her name was Debbie. And she said, well, it's a very sweet story. I have a little six-year-old girl, and she had a friend who was a Christian. And one day I picked up my little girl and Debbie 
I picked up my little girl and her little Christian friend, and we got in bad traffic, and I swore. And all of a sudden, I hear this sweet little six-year-old voice in the back seat say, Oh, Miss Debbie, don't do that. It grieves Jesus. <laughs> and she goes, What did I do? And she said, You took his name in vain, and it hurt his heart. Well, she had no idea. So she said, why would you say that? She said, in the Bible, it says in the Ten Commandments, don't swear, because it hurts God's heart. All you have to do is just ask him, and he'll come and meet you. Well, she was so shaken, she said, Beth, I went home to my husband and said, did you know there are some things that we do that grieve God's heart? He said, what are you talking about? He said, she said, swearing's not good. He said, well, everybody does it. And she said, I know, but, and named a little friend and said, it says so in the Bible. And he said, well, I don't want to make God's heart sad, do you? She said, no, I don't either. And do you know what happened? said, I guess that's why they have churches. Do you imagine? So people can know God. This happened in Alabama. <laughs> sure enough, she called up the little six-year-old Jesus girl, Christian girl, and he called up the mommy and said, could we ever come to church with you on Sunday? God uses the weak and foolish to confound in the mighty. And that whole family found Jesus. And it was the testimony of a little gal. But the people around had no idea that it was even wrong to swear. They just didn't even know. They never had an encounter with the Holy One. But God is coming and saying, wait, there's another way to live. And it just, it, and it's me. It's me. It's Jesus. Sanctified in Christ Jesus. Called to be saints. And with all who call in every place on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And do you know there's four calls in these verse 9 verses. And do you know this call is, and it's a Greek word I can't even pronounce, but it's the middle verb. And you're called, and I'm called, and Katya's called, and Maya's called, and and the Hung and the Honduran church is called, and the and the Russian pastors are called, and the we are met together, and it is the middle verb. We are how are we identified? We know him. What is the middle verb? Before Papa went to heaven, he kept talking about the middle verb. And what it is, it's where and this is a per, little personal, but it's like a, Al kissed Beth. Beth kissed Al. They kissed. This call is you're called, I'm called, we're called. And what is the uniting thing? The middle verb is that in the name of Jesus, all those who call on the name of the Lord are part of the fellowship of the unashamed of God. And it transcends continents, it transcends time, and it transcends space. It is part of the fellowship with this God, sacred fellowship, and then with one. Do you know, ladies, I remember when Katie Beth and Dan were newly married and went to Jumu Hungry. There was one phone in the town, and it was at the post office. We didn't hear from him much because there was a big Russian lady who ran the post office. And so we didn't hear from him. So I get this letter. And she said, Mom, she said one day if he was teaching in one school English and Bible. She was teaching in another school. It had been under communism for 40 years. There was no churches, no life, but the people wanted Bible classes for their children after the wall came down. One day, she said, Jesus, in her quiet time, is there anybody else in this town who loves you? And of course, at that time, she didn't speak Hungarian. She said, Jesus, I'm so homesick and lonesome. 
could you just leave me your one believer in this town? Just let me know I'm not alone. Ever been there? <laughs> so she said she finished teaching school and she walked home. And as she was walking home, all of a sudden she passed this little older woman, probably my age, who was sleeping. She was younger than I am now, but sleeping. <laughs> and so and so she greeted her. And then she walked by. Well, all of a sudden, as she walked by, she's going down the street, she heard this woman calling to her in Hungarian. And she turned around and then she waves to her. And so Katie Beth came back and then she waves some more. And then she said, come in, to like you come to the house. And she walked into that Hungarian home. And there was the Bible with reading glasses spread out. And then Ildiko was her name, stood there and started singing in Hungarian, Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. And Katie Beth stood there and sang in English, Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. Called on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, both theirs and ours. And how many times have you and I prayed with women at the altar and they've come from another language group and they'll say when they really get serious with God, can I just pray in my heart language? And when I was in Colombia and would pray with my Francisca, my prayer partner, and she would pray in Spanish and I pray in English because one of the times the pain in your heart is so great, you have to pray in your soul language, the heart language of whatever your native tongue is. God wants to night us together. And it's sweet. I met Ann Knight the first time here. We've been on the prayer call and I was so surprised. We got to meet, we looked at her and boy, we've heard each other for two years recognizing our voices but never having met face to face. That is the incredible fellowship of the unashamed. When you say yes to Jesus, you enter into the Trinitarian conversation with God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Ladies and gentlemen, that is good company. But also, you enter into the Trinitarian fellowship around the globe. Amen. For God so loved the world that he came, that whosoever believeth in him Oh, God wants to make us real Christians. So he invites us as we go home into the fellowship with Jesus, Father, Son, and Spirit, and into the fellowship of one another. Don't miss him. Don't miss him. Don't go home and sing. Then what else does he give us as we go home? Grace and peace. Who else can give us grace and peace? No one, because they come from God. And I thank God because the grace of God, which is given to each one of us as we say yes to him, can enrich us in every way. And how does it begin? In my speech. So he can he is big enough, he can touch my heart so that what comes out of my mouth is not gross and grumpy and mean or vulgar, or evil-spirited, or selfish, but love, 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 and more love, because that's who he is. And then he can frame your words and my words. Like Psalm 45 says, he can anoint our, mouth, our speech, our lips with grace. He can anoint our garments with myrrh, cassia, fragrance, and aloes, so that the suffering, even what we wear, who we are, the suffering we've gone through, the healing he's brought us, and then the cassia is the beauty and fragrance of yellow flowers, so that God can come in every part of your life and mine, can be anointed with the oil of gladness more than anyone else around us, because we have an inner secret. We are in him, and he is in us. Amen. Amen. I want to tell you that's about the happiest way to live in the whole wide world. <laughs> and the good news is I'm getting so old now, his track record is superb. <laughs> 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 
so it, and it can enrich my knowledge. So it can begin to put things together like we heard from Maya this morning. The, the dichotomy of daffodils and new life in a war and the two little graves on the in a woman's front yard for her son. The dichotomy of life and new is big enough for that only God. But there is hope even in death because of one who has come. And I don't know what your situation is or what, where you come from, but God says, I am the God of all hope. And I can transform, rebuild, restore, and renew if you will let me. And I can make new. So he says, utterance and knowledge. And then he can begin to give you and I the mind of Christ. So that the testimony of Christ was confirmed in the Corinthians. That was a miracle. They had come out of a pagan, wicked lifestyle. But they had been confirmed in, in, in the Corinthians. So there's hope for you. There's hope for me. If you can do it for the Corinthians, there's hope for us. But not only that, so that if we can, and all the gifts that they needed for life and godliness were provided in the person of Jesus. First, Second Peter 1, 8. And it's all the gifts you and I need for what God is calling us to in the place he's put us. He can give us and equip us for what he's called us to. So we can live there in him godly and we can and life can go on he will give us the plan to go on so eagerly and we're expectant christians eagerly waiting for the revelation of jesus christ that's the ultimate revelation of jesus christ when he comes again but sometimes you say jesus i need to, you to come to supper <laughs> Or I need you to come on this conversation that's very difficult. Or Jesus, I need you to come into our workplace. There's tension there. And that Jesus can, we live not saying there's no hope. What can be done? Well, with me. Because that's when you and I look at our adequacy instead of his all-sufficiency. And God wants to move in today so that you and I live in expectant anticipation of the most difficult situations in our lives that Jesus can come. And that he is able to keep us blameless until he comes back. How is that possible? He's faithful. And by whom we are called into the fellowship of Jesus Christ our Lord. I want to know, do you know him? Or do you just know about him? <clears throat> oh, if you haven't tasted how good he is, you are missing the sweetest blessing in this world and in the world to come. And immediately it goes. We're in the fellowship here, the fellowship with one another. We're saints together. He makes our hearts pure. Then he provides grace and peace for life. And then he enriches us, even my tongue, even my brain. And then, then we wait in expectation for what only God can do in you and in me. Then, then Paul switches a little because he's gotten some information from Chloe's household that there's divisions and fights in the family of God and in the church. And even as you've been at the end, there may be some of you who have gotten texts or phone calls. There, there's a little funny activity going back on at your home or in your church or in your family or at your bank account or in your marriage. And you go, oh my goodness. So we switch from all the glory of God into the nitty gritty of where we all live. <laughs> Do you know what God says? And I love this. Every one of those difficulties, beginning with tensions in relationships, we all know those, do we not? Yeah. Become a door for Jesus to come and reveal himself in your life and in my life. They become a door for God to come. And if you and I do not have wisdom as to know how to go forward in those tensions, like we're in Chloe's household, we can inquire of the Lord 
just like we did in Bible study in Steubenville a couple weeks ago. And he said, count it all joy because the problems become a doorway. And then if you lack wisdom, ask of God. And he will say, Betty, do this. Don't do that. Be quiet. Talk. Sit down. What He will give directions. And while you listen for his voice, you will begin to cultivate this love relationship with God and you will begin to see grace and peace move into relationships that you thought were utterly hopeless and broken forever. Amen. Why? Because Jesus Christ has come. Amen. Jesus Christ has come. Any divisions in your life? Any needs where you need Jesus? Now the secret we pick up in 2.18 because we have to keep him sinful because how we live and who we are will be misunderstood by the world in which we live. But we don't have to feel afraid of that because it's Christ crucified, the Lord of glory. And the wisdom of this world doesn't make it. And the wisdom of this world looks at what we're saying to them and they can't understand it. It's confusing and a stumbling block. But we, but Christ, we have to just hold on to Jesus. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's Jesus. And then look at verse 30. And he's been saying this over and over again the past week. But of, but of him, all of us who are in Christ Jesus, Jesus becomes, can you read him? Wisdom. I didn't really need to know what to do or how to go forward. What's the next one? Righteousness. Anybody, how to think. First, it's the mind of Christ. Second, how to act. Third, it's the purification of my mind, heart, will, motives, and my self-talk. That's what Jesus says. And he's my redemption. He's my savior. He's my savior. In this Holy Week, as we prepare for Holy Communion, Jesus comes to us again and says, Surely, Jesus has borne your griefs and mine. He has carried your sorrows and mine. He, he was smitten and we esteemed him not. He was afflicted. He was wounded for your sins and my sins. The chastisement that gave me peace was put on him. By his stripes, I am healed and you are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to our own way. But the secret today is we can say, Jesus, I'm coming. I'm not going to leave you. I am with you 150% full, led, and empowered by the Spirit of Jesus. Is that your reality today? And then he says, I, I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech. There's hope. Or of declaring testimony of God. I determined to know nothing among you, save Jesus Christ, and crucified. I was with you in weakness, in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words, so that the power of God, like our little six year old friend, could be made known. It wasn't in anybody but God that made that happen. Mm -hmm. And isn't it, isn't it helpful to realize that Paul was sometimes afraid? He didn't speak well. He trembled because sometimes as we go home to face what we have to face, that is exactly how we are. But the reality is if Jesus comes, he can take us and he can transform. 
any situation for our good, His glory, and redemptive purposes. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this is the wisdom that God gives to us. Verse 6 and chapter 2. The wisdom of God is a mystery. The hidden wisdom which God ordained before the before the ages for our glory, which none of the rulers knew. For that they known, they wouldn't have crucified Jesus. They didn't know what they did. But as it is written, I have not seen, nor ear heard, neither has it entered into the life of them. Or put your name in it. The things that Jesus has prepared for those who love him. And ladies I, and gentlemen, I think that's my life first. Because as I look back, I think all I can see is the goodness of God. And he surprised me over and over and over again in the blessings of his goodness which is God himself. And as you and I enter into suffering, which happens to all of us, it becomes like C.S. Lewis, God's megaphone to us, because then he is calling us into a wider place of his person, and we begin to know him in the depths and ways we could have never known without the pain and the frustration. And then we watch Jesus as he walks with us, and he walks us through it, and we come into his living presence here and in the world. And how do we know the goodness of God? And how can we see how he's working in our lives? The only way is it is revealed by his spirit. That is why it is essential to be filled with the Holy Spirit of God. That is why Jesus said, pray. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Are there any here today who feel like they're orphans? Nobody cares. Nobody understands. Jesus said, I do. I made you. And I can carry you with those everlasting arms so that you are never, ever alone again. It says, for the Spirit searches all things. And then the Spirit shares the deep things of God, even with the likes of human nature. That's incredible. Just as my Spirit speaks, and I, I know what I'm thinking, I can't know what you're thinking, because it's Spirit to Spirit. But the Holy Spirit knows the mind of Christ, so He can reveal His mind for you, for me, for our kids, for our grandkids, for the children you're raising, for the ones that are in your Sunday school class, for the Bible study you're teaching, and say, this one needs this, and this one needs that. And then you begin to find that the Ephesians talks about hard eyes to begin to reach out in ways you never dreamed possible that are led by the precious Spirit of God. So every place your life goes, God comes. Sing and rejoice, O oh, daughters of Zion. I'm coming. And do you know he is coming through? You and me. Amen. So they look and see a reflection of his glory, <coughs> even in your life and my life. Is there any greater miracle than that? No. These things the Holy Spirit teaches us. Anything you need to have him help you with, just ask him. Mm -hmm. And Jesus will teach you what to do, how to go, when to go. Mm -hmm. And we have testimonies of that we've heard just in this room. And God's provision and care. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he can instruct him? No one. But you and I, as we leave the inn at the Amish door, you and I can have the mind of Christ. Do you know what today? Do you know what 